Man, we, uh, if we haven't met before, if you're, maybe you're new this morning, my name is Adam and I'm the pastor here. And man, my prayer for you today is this, that you would experience the power and the presence of God and experience the love of Jesus by just being here, part of our community. And uh, just so thankful if you've chosen to worship with us and you're a first-time guest that you're here this morning. Let me kind of fill you in on where we're at. We are concluding our series today that we've entitled Low Hanging Fruit. And uh, we're in the book of uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. And isn't it crazy that Thanksgiving is already here? And we're about to go into our Christmas series next. Thanksgiving is here and the holiday season is here. I can't believe that we're coming down to 2023. But, man, we, uh, let me read you this definition of low-hanging fruit so you kind of pick up where we're at uh, this morning. This is, we've been reading this most every single week. This is the definition. It means this, easy things that can be most readily done or dealt with in achieving success or making progress toward an objective. So I pray if you've been here every single week that you've gotten this by now, that the goal of this series has been and is today that we would set our attention and put our affection on Jesus. We would connect ourselves to the vine And then we will easily live out the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, as we're talking about self-control today, the only way to have self-control, true self-control, is to be connected to Jesus. But one of the traps that we fall into as Christians oftentimes is that oftentimes we'll fix our eyes on the gifts of the Spirit instead of what? The giver of every good and perfect gift. And it results in this shallow relationship with a loving father. And I believe that God has so much more for us. Can, can, you, can you imagine what it would be like if we walked in the gifts of the spirit? Because you, you can do that, and, but, not be, uh, but not be connected to, to the vine, not connected to Jesus, and not living out the fruit of the spirit. Can you see how dangerous that would be? If you're operating in this wisdom is, is a gift and, 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 and gift of tongues is a gift and prophecy is a gift, and you're operating these things without walking in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so the series is really about laying a foundation. I hope we've done that. I hope we've laid a foundation so we can walk in the gifts of the Spirit. So that when we do so, our community and our church and where we go, we can operate them in a healthy way. Let's read Galatians chapter 5. Uh, This morning, Uh, verse 22, it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Say self-control. That's awesome. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another. Or envying one another. So let's talk about this fruit, the fruit of self control that is easily obtainable as we connect ourselves to the vine and we spend time with Jesus and we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide our lives. Before we do that, before we dive into this message, let's pray right now, invite the Holy Spirit to speak. Holy Spirit, you can take the room. I pray that, God, that you would speak to every single person in this room. Lord, we literally do not want to move from this moment without you. Lord, I've said this in the beginning, but, God, no one came here today to hear from me. But, Holy Spirit, we all came here to hear from you. We have to hear your voice today. So, Holy Spirit, we say this morning, God, speak to us, oh God, for your servants are listening. We need you so desperately, God. Lord, I pray that in our lives right now, God, that you would place a hunger and a desire for you, Jesus. God, take us to a place that is deeper, that is further than we've ever been before. God, we're not here to play church or to, or to uh, put a checkbox off, off in what we do, God, but we're here just for you, Jesus. So, God, we say to us to this morning, just breathe upon your word. Make your logos word rhema, God. We have to hear from you today. 
Lord, fill my mouth with your words and my thoughts, God. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a study, a test by a scientist, and they did what was called a marshmallow test. Sounds really scientific, doesn't it? And they gave kids a marshmallow and said, hey, if you can wait for 10 minutes before you eat this marshmallow, I'll give you another marshmallow. So they gave the marshmallow to a different select number of kids, and the kids that didn't eat the marshmallow got another marshmallow 10 minutes later. They followed these kids and found out that those kids who waited to eat the marshmallow and ate the marshmallow after 10 minutes, uh, and they got another marshmallow, uh, it was found that those kids were more successful than the kids that ate the marshmallow because what? They had self-control, delayed gratification. Now, my wife's out of town this week, so I decided to try this on my own kids. They're probably a little older than, than, most, than the most kids that they, that they uh, tested back in the 1960s, uh, but uh, both of my kids, they actually, they didn't eat the marshmallow. They waited. They were really excited about the marshmallow. I did this last night, and, uh, and they waited. So I, I claim right now that my kids are going to be successful in life. Amen. Yes. Delay gratification, self-control. Self-control, if you have it, things will go well with you. If you don't have it, you choose not to have self-control, you'll make unwise decisions that will lead to a difficult life. You know, I've never heard of a, uh, a, a couple going into a marriage relationship about to get married, you know, say... Man, I cannot wait for the possibility of getting a divorce one day. I've never heard that before. Have you? Absolutely not. No one thinks it's going to be them one day. But yet, 50% of marriages end a divorce. And what's even staggering is this, that 50% of Christian marriages end in divorce. Like the statistic doesn't even change. But watch this. When I was looking at the stats, I found out this. That if you were to wait until marriage to have sex, the percentage of it goes down to only 11%. In that relationship, if you wait until marriage, the stat goes down to only 11%, from 50% to 11%. Staggering. Why? Because they're able to have self-control in that area, and that self-control then goes back to self-control in their relationship with their spouse. Because what do we know? Love is a choice, isn't it? Love is a decision that you make to love your spouse despite difficulty, despite things that are going on, and you together are choosing to love one another, and love is a choice, and you have self-control not to do things that will make your spouse terribly mad, right? You have Um, self-control. This is what the uh, National Marriage Project says about this. Marriages are held together by a strong ethic commitment. Cohabiting relationships, by their very nature, tend to undermine this ethic. The relationships of non-married persons differs from married couples in their levels of commitment and autonomy. Once this low commitment, high autonomy pattern of relating becomes learned, it becomes hard to unlearn. Matter of fact, I found out this, that cohabiting women, they are two times more likely to be physically abused and three times more likely to suffer from depression. Many will think that not having self-control in this area, oh, it's not a big deal, it's not that big uh, of a thing if I just fall into my desires and what I want. But really? Is it really? Because what will happen down the road is gonna cause some problems and some friction. I mean, the stats pointed out, right? We have statistics right there. And what happens is not even just affecting you, but it's affecting your kids or your future kids. It's affecting even your legacy and their kid, your kids' kids and their kids' kids, right? What does Romans say? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. And I'm not here to beat you up this morning, 
Because at any point, man, you can just choose. I'm going to follow Jesus from this point forward. I'm going to, I'm going to do what the word of God says to do. Because how many of you know that God's way is absolutely the best way? And so if you messed up, don't beat yourself up about it. Just say, Lord, I'm just going to follow you from this day forward. And if it's difficult and it's hard to do, and there's a lot of other things that, are, that go into this decision, um, maybe it's uh, even financial or something else, man, come talk to us afterwards and we'd love to help you out in that situation. We're not here to judge you. I'm not here to cast a judgment towards you or condemnation whatsoever. I'm just here to tell you because I want your relationships to be healthy. But more importantly, I want your relationship with God to be healthy. Amen. Yeah. I want to give you the definition of self-control. Self-control is this. It's a combination of two Greek words. In kratos. In means what? In. <laughs> kratos means strength, power, might, or dominion. A person within kratos has a, is a person who has strength within. The question we must ask ourselves is, who rules our lives? Who's in control of our life? Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't rule, then what? The flesh rules. Self-control is one of the greatest abilities the Holy Spirit gives us. This fruit develops in our lives as we stay close to Jesus and mature and walk with him. All of us have self-control in one area of our life, but then maybe lack in another area of our life, right? Right? And the sinful nature is listed out here in Galatians chapter 5. Here's the sinful nature listed out in Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Now, some of these, you might be saying, man, those are pretty extreme, right? Adam, you don't have to worry about me murdering someone. You don't have to worry about me committing adultery. But listen what Jesus says, because he takes things even a step further. Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Church, we are in a battle. And Galatians talks about this. We're in a battle against the flesh and we're in a battle against the spirit. And the only way to control it is to listen to the spirit. My prayer for you is this, that you would be able to hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit in your life instead of the shouts of the enemy and the shouts of culture that you need to do it this way. You'll be able to, to, be able to distinguish between the two and have self-control and to hear the Holy Spirit. And as you begin to hear the Holy Spirit, you will then be able to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the m most incredible thing when you really think about uh, these fruit of the Spirit, what I believe is this, that Paul wrote these out through the Holy Spirit's leading in this particular order. If you put Galatians 5 on the screen, just think about it. If you have love, you'll have joy. If you have peace, you'll have patience. Love, joy, and peace leads to patience. And then kindness will be a part of your life and Goodness will be who you are, and faithfulness will be easy in your life. You'll live and be a faithful person, and then gentleness will be a part of who you are in self-control. Can you see how these work out into order? What, and just more evidence of this is, think about it. What was Jesus' greatest commandment of all? That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It all starts with this first fruit of love. To love God. To really love the Lord. Not just to know him intellectually, but to know him. To have this relationship with his loving father. I was driving through North Carolina and I was... Uh, visiting my parents and coming back home, I was by myself and I was just spending time with the Lord just about two years ago. And I felt the Lord just in that moment ask me this question, Adam, do you love me? 
And I said to the Lord, Lord, you know I love you. He said, do you love me with all your heart? I said, God, you have my heart. You know that. I have a heart after you. He asked me, Adam, do you love me with all of your soul? Lord, I love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul. My soul being my mind, my will, and my emotions. Lord, I want to follow you. Then he asked me, do you love me with all of your strength? When it got to that point, I thought to myself, man, there's things in my life that I am not disciplined over. That I might have the heart for God. I might want to do the right thing, but this one area, do I love the Lord with all of my strength? Do I have self-control? Because at the time, there was things in my life that were not necessarily bad, but were holding me back from walking into the purpose that God has for me. Specifically, that I thought of was my diet at the time. That might sound silly to you, but I felt like at the time that my diet was holding me back from really following the Lord. It could be anything for you in this place. And that may not be the issue. But see, what I was eating was slowing me down. What I was eating was causing me to be tired all the time. I couldn't wake up early enough to spend time with Jesus. I might want to. I might have this desire to, but I wasn't able to be disciplined in this area because this one area of eating what I want, all this pasta, because I love pasta so much, was causing me to be tired. You ever ate something after lunch and you're like, whoa, I've got the, I've got the mid-afternoon blues at this time. I can't really concentrate. I've got this foggy brain. It just felt like I was always walking in that. And the Lord was kind of convicting me, Adam, you got to love me with all of your strength. you got to say no to some of these things. Sometimes within the context of, uh, of balance is okay, but I was completely out of balance in this area. It was affecting everything else. And he was saying, Adam, love me in this area with all of your strength. With all of your strength. Be disciplined in this area. And as you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength... I mean, God just begins to, to use these fruits and begins to operate them in your life. Amen? Will you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength? Because if we don't have love, we won't have this supernatural self-control in our life. If we don't have self-control, how can we run this race well that Jesus is calling us to run? And make no mistake about it, church, we are all running a race. We're all going somewhere. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says this, verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Who wants to receive the prize? Come on. Yes. But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should not become disqualified. We're here to run a race, church. Are you running the race? Let me give you three things on this race in life that we are all running. Number one, winning the race, the, the race, winning the race requires self-control. Winning the race requires self-control. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, we just read this. Let me read it again. But I discipline my body. And I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. You see, no athlete wins the race without being in pristine condition from training. And the wonderful thing about Christ is that because of God's grace, all believers can be in good condition. Philippians 4.13 Many of you are familiar with this. I can do what? Everything or all things through him that gives me strength. Where we may have been out of control before we came to Christ, we now can have self-control because he will give us the ability. Self-control and discipline is critical in this race church that we are running. Our generation, it suffers from a lack of self-control. 
And we constantly need to discipline our bodies by avoiding things that would be harmful to them. We must discipline our thinking by being cautious about what we read, what we watch, what we look at on social media. We must have the self-control to feed our minds with truth, to feed our minds with purity. How do we do this? By developing habits of studying the word, of fasting, of meditation, of prayer. We not only want to get in shape, but we want to win this battle against the enemy. Because, listen, there is a battle and he is trying to destroy you. There is a battle and he is trying to destroy you. You know, let me be honest with you this morning. I've been so angry with the enemy recently. I'm just going to be vulnerable. I, I feel like since I've walked into this role back in June that the attacks of the enemy have just been onslaught. It's one thing after another, one thing after another, and I knew it was going to be difficult, but I didn't know how difficult it was really going to be. It's just like one attack after the other, one gut punch after the other. But here's the thing. I've come before the Lord. I've said, Lord, I know that you've got this. Greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. And you might have come to a place in your own life personally, and you might have thought, man, there is too much in my life. There's too much going on, and the enemy feels like he's attacking one after the other, after the other, after the other. And he's giving you a gut punch, and he's telling you things that are not true and he's telling you lies of the enemy and what I'm here to tell you this morning just like me and I'm telling the enemy this is I'm here to stand I'm still standing enemy it doesn't matter what you say it doesn't matter what you do I know my God is in control and every fiery dart of the enemy it will not prevail because God is in control he is working he is moving and listen he cannot have control. It is only us giving it up to him. But I'm here to tell you this morning, we are not allowing him in. We are here to stand and stand firm and know that God has called us for such a time as this to take this region for Jesus, to see the outpouring presence of God and have be a host of his presence in a place, in 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 a people that need Jesus so desperately. We will not back down. But we will stand and stand firm. And this is what I know, that one of the most underutilized weapons that God has given us, we don't like it very much, it's prayer and it's fasting. It's prayer and it's fasting. You might be saying, Adam, why are you talking about fasting right before Thanksgiving? (laughs) I'm about to stuff my belly with some stuffing and dressing. Stuffing or dressing? I think it's dressing, y'all. I don't know about y'all. Do y'all think it's dressing or stuffing? I, we have this debate in, the, in, 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 st- in staff meetings sometimes. I'm like, guys, it's dressing. I don't care what you say. Like, it's still, no. But one of the biggest enemies, one of the biggest weapons that we have is fasting. You know, Jesus, he fasted for 40 days. Moses and Elijah, they fasted for 40 days. Daniel fasted for 21. Paul fasted for uh, 14, 7, and 4 days. Throughout the New Testament, the, the Acts church, they went in different periods and times of fasting. Jesus says, when you pray, when you fast, meaning it should be an ongoing thing and rhythm in our lives of prayer and fasting. And what... I believe that the Lord is calling us into, I want to go ahead and tell you about it now so you can anticipate it after the holiday season, is this. I believe that the Lord is calling us to 21 days of of prayer and fasting next year, starting January the 9th. And I believe there's going to be so much breakthrough in our lives personally, in in, in the life of this church. Amen? That as we begin to um, bring our bodies under self-control... There's different, all kinds of different types of fast, and we'll talk about that as we get uh, to it. We bring our bodies underneath self-control, then it's, we're, we're going we're gonna to conquer when the enemy comes against us because it is one of the greatest tools. But this is also what I believe that the Lord wants to do. 
I want to go ahead and tell you about this. Is Wednesday nights next year, we're going to be having a prayer service every single Wednesday night. Every single Wednesday night, we're going to be having a prayer service. Jesus says that my house will be called a house of prayer. It will be called a house of prayer. And what I feel like the Lord has given, he gave me this word, and it's been confirmed in so many different areas. It's just crazy. It blows my mind. Is He's given me this, this kind of vision for next year. We're going to be talking about this, uh, as, what this means uh, in, in the coming uh, weeks next year. But he's given me the word multiplication, supernatural multiplication. How is it going to happen? It's going to happen through prayer, y'all. It's going to happen as we literally make this church a house of prayer. Some people think prayer, man, what a boring thing. I believe the most on fire service is going to be our Wednesday night prayer service, y'all. That's what we're going towards. That's what the Lord is calling us into. So I pray that you are anticipating that. You're ready to go. You're ready to move. How many believe this for breakthrough next year through fasting and prayer? Come on. Yeah. Fasting is one of the best ways to bring our bodies under self-control. Number two this morning, we need to know where we are going. In this race that we're running, we need to know where we're going. Where are we going? What's the goal? John 17, verse 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Where are we going? What is the goal? It's to know God. That's it. It's to know God. That's why our vision is what it is. To build a community of people is life around the presence of God. Because when we really abide in his presence and we really are spending time with him, we're going to know him. Not just know about him intellectually, I say that a lot, but to really know and have relationship with this loving father. Have you ever met someone before who doesn't know where they're going? And I'm not talking about a change of careers. I'm talking about those who may have prayed the prayer, but then they have not made a commitment to serve Jesus and be obedient to his commands. They may attend church sometimes and periodically read the word, but they haven't decided to die to themselves and to fully live for God. And they are cultural Christians. And what I believe is that the pandemic, like nothing else, killed cultural Christianity, but I also believe that now... We can fall back into the trap of cultural Christianity very easily, of just making the checkbox, of just going through the motions. And we are not going to fall into that trap here at Journey, are we? We're not here to be cultural Christians. We're here to what? Live our lives for the glory of God. What does Jesus say? John 10.10. 10. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The prize of eternal life is worth the strict training and denial of our sinful desires. If we keep our eye on the goal and do not let anything distract us, we will understand that it will be worth it all when we get to heaven. Amen? Leads me to point number three this morning. We cannot look back at our failures. If you're running the race, you cannot look back at your failures. This is with Philippians 3, 13 through 14. I hope this encourages you. We all have failures, y'all. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Do not be discouraged this morning if you failed in a particular area. Forget about your failures. And look at this, Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. I'm going to forget about it. And reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If we are to grow in the area of self-control, we can't let our past mistakes persuade us that we will never live an overcoming life. Some let their failures paralyze them and they quit before they even try. If we constantly look back to our failures or times we didn't accomplish a goal, we will let discouragement come into our lives and won't have the will to try again. We can learn from our mistakes, not allow them to paralyze us and get stuck in the past. Many have tried to quit a destructive habit in their life. Maybe it's getting their anger under control or a drug addiction or alcohol abuse or overeating or pornography, 
only to fail over and over and over again. But as Christians, we have an advantage. We can pray, seek God's forgiveness for sinful behavior, and ask him for ways to overcome these habits. We can forget our past and go after the goal, the goal to really know the Father, to really know Jesus. Paul writes, Galatians 5.16, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The Holy Spirit who lives in us helps us when we fight battles of temptation. It is not our own effort that allows us to overcome, but it is when we are connected to Jesus and then we are able to overcome sin, we're able to overcome trials and tribulations in our life, we're able to overcome temptation, because the Spirit of God helps us. Y'all, you can overcome anything in your life because the Spirit and the presence of God is with you. May we, may we walk in the fruit of the Spirit. May we operate in the fruit of the Spirit. May we operate in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's my prayer for us, if we've laid this foundation of doing so, that, man, we would be connected to the vine, connected to Jesus, and really know him. Would you rise with me this morning?